to thank you for the opportunity to be here today to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is the pathology of interstitial lung disease. I have the pre-lunch slot, so I'll try to be efficient um, and not belabor things that are not directly pathology because we've covered a lot of the contextual information that I put at the beginning. I have no disclosures to share with you. No pathologist gives a talk without showing histology, but I think I only have two of, uh, histology slides and one at the end. Um, so this is a low power view of, um, of a lung section from a, a surgical lung biopsy. And if you were to draw a line right here, you can appreciate that the right hand half of the image is essentially collagen with minimal inflammation, a little bit of lymphoid infiltrate. And the left hand side shows beautiful intact functional alveoli, which is where we'd like to be. And right here is a looser area of scar, which corresponds to a fibroblastic focus. So in this field, we have all of the key features for the UIP pattern. Um, and then this slide shows the other uh, idiopathic lesion that we look for. The larger image here shows a diffuse and uniform infiltration of al intact alveoli, no scarring, with a mononuclear infiltrate. Um, and this is the pattern of cellular NSIP. The bottom right shows some more fibrotic than cellular, and presumably this lesion over time will progress to this pattern. So these are the two common patterns that we look for uh, in surgical lung biopsies. And we all live and die by this uh, paper from 2011, which uh, frames the approach to diagnosis and management. And of course, I live in the diagnosis realm. Um, and one of the benefits is we have a nice definition here of IPS and the pathologist comes in right about here. So the point I want to make here is that by the time the case gets to me, all of the simple ones have been picked off clinically and by radiology. And uh, it's not true for me that 75% of the cases are either UIP or chronic hypersensitivity. So those 130 odd diseases really do enter into the differential when I have a surgical lung biopsy. Um, and uh, as we've heard multiple times, the accuracy will increase with multidisciplinary discussion. Um, and I think in 2017, we've moved from histology being a definitive classifier to a much better outcome with multidisciplinary assessment. Okay, and here's the simple algorithm. And again, the pathologist comes in fairly late in the game at the point of surgical lung biopsy. And these are the major categories that we're striving for. Um, and so I'm here in the lab at the microscope and then we do have a monthly multidisciplinary discussion that happens in a formal setting uh, as well as a lot of phone calls and unofficial conversations about context. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I, when I'm talking to trainees about these biopsies, um, which we all find difficult, um, I try to remind them that um, the clinical diagnosis is, um, is pretty accurate. And what I thought was interesting about this one is that I looked at 60 clinical cases of ILD, 400 pulmonologists with no other consultation, a mix of level of expertise. 20 of the 60 were diagnosed as IPF by the experts, most with high confidence. But the interesting finding was that with 20 years experience, it didn't matter what your level of expertise was, that the more patients that you saw and the more multidisciplinary conferences you attended, listened to, your colleagues in pulmonology, the radiologist and the pathologist, you actually get better. And um, after 20 years, you all reach the same level of expertise. So then the pathologist comes in with the other 40 cases of the 60 in which uh, confident diagnosis was not reached prior to biopsy. Um, and and I, again, when I'm talking to trainees, we, I remind them that the function of this process is usually to exclude alternative diagnosis and the pathologist enters at the point of a VATS wedge. Um, and so, again, we live by this uh, revision, which is 2013, the original I think was 01 or 02, very detailed criteria that um, for the pathologist kind of reshuffled um, the categories into something that was a little bit easier um, to manage. And what they did for us was, so when I started in this field, we had BIP, GIP, BOOP, LIP, whatever. <laughs> Um, and did not have the benefit of high-res CT and a lot of open lung biopsies, and so mostly we had clinical and ch plain ch uh, chest film. Um, and we now have this, which is much better. So what they did was they gave us major and rare idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. Um, and, um, and then this unclassifiable category, which is no one's favorite, um, but we're sometimes left with it. Um, and so 
th these are the criteria for the pathologist and for a definite diagnosis of UIP, we have to see marked fibrosis with architectural distortion or honeycombing to the extent that you cannot identify residual alveolar septa. Um, you just see a blotch of scar. Um, the patchiness at low power is key to the diagnosis, which I think limits the size of the biopsy that we can use for definitive diagnosis, at least at this point in time. Presence of fibroblastic foci, which we'll talk about more in a second. And an absence of features that essentially exclude UIP, and those are listed on the far right here. Any of these findings may um, lead us away from a diagnosis of UIP, and these are often present on transbronchial biopsy. So again, the, the function of a transbronch is often to allow you to exclude or render unlikely the diagnosis of UIP. And then these two in the middle, probable and possible, are variations on a theme of lacking some of these criteria or this situation in which only honeycomb changes are present on the biopsy, and we'll talk about that more toward the end. Um, so assuming that we get to a diagnosis of UIP on a biopsy, I want to make a couple of points about that. First of all, if you're fortunate enough to have a surgeon who will give you wedge biopsies of more than one lobe, um, and sometimes when that happens, up to a quarter of the time in one study, um, they're discordant, and you get UIP pattern in one biopsy and NSIP pattern in the other lobe. And in a series that looked at, at a many of those cases, it turned out that the clinical course, if either, either biopsy had UIP, was that of UIP. So the bottom line is the UIP pattern will trump an NSIP pattern if both are present. Okay. The other point I want to make is that it looks like um, this is a hard thing to quantify on a biopsy, but if there are a lot of fibroblastic foci present, there is more rapid progression and earlier mortality of the disease and a decline in spirometry and diffusing capacity in the six to 12 months after the biopsy. And so in the fine print that Dr. Fisher was talking about earlier in the PATH report, I often try to mention there's a few, they're rare, they're occasional, they're numerous, they're innumerable, just to give you some idea of the degree of activity uh, of the disease, at least in that biopsy. Always remembering that the radiologist biopsies the whole lung and the pathologist has only a little wedge of a particular place. Um, okay, um, and I want to talk just a minute about the unclassifiable uh, idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. I find that there are two reasons for this most commonly, and one is the biopsy is targeted to an area that on the CT scan is clearly all honeycombing which is usually not informative. What you want is the junction between the more normal tissue and the end stage, and a little conversation with the surgeon ahead of time is often helpful. Um, and the other thing, um, with apologies to my rheumatology colleagues for my level of detail here, if there's a mix of patterns or you can't meet criteria for any of the classifiable idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, in the long run, most of those patients turn out to have some variation on connective tissue disease. Um, um, so again, in it you have either inadequate clinical radiologic or pathologic data, and that may just be because of the natural history of the disease, um, or you have discordant findings that may relate to prior therapy. So uh, inflammation, for example, will sometimes fall out of tissue if, it's been, if they've been treated with anti-inflammatory therapy before the biopsy. New entities or new variants may cause variations in appearance. And again, these diseases are often heterogeneous, as we saw in the radiology talk. Um, again, this theme has come up repeatedly today, but hypersensitivity is a problem for the pathologist. It can mimic in various biopsies, NSIP and UIP, depending on the nature of whatever is, it, the person is hypersensitive to, the duration of exposure and the intermittent nature of exposure. So in a, the classic pattern for hypersensitivity from the pathologist standpoint is granulomas next to the airway, interstitial pneumonitis, and edema and granulation tissue in the bronchiolar lumen. Well, it's very uncommon to have all three of those unless there's been recent fairly intense exposure. And as that resolves, what you're often left with is kind of a patchy interstitial infiltrate, which is not specific for anything. Um, and so if you have a big enough biopsy that you can assess bronchiolocentricity, that can be quite helpful. Um, but once this becomes chronic, the scarring is often not limited to the area around the airway and it becomes a, a problem to sort it out from the idiopathic diseases. 
and I think we've talked about um, connective tissue disease enough today. Um, so in terms of the other diagnoses that come up besides the ones we've been discussing this morning, um, this is a, without going through a lot of detail in this, it, it turned out that um, given that a lot of patients don't go to biopsy these days, um, it, um, you end up with a lot of less common diagnoses. And this is um, the multidisciplinary team diagnosis on the left and the pathologist on the right. And first of all, what you can see, of course, is it's the most common, 21 of the 71 were UIP, but there were a lot of other diagnoses listed here. And the pathologist was not all that great at making a lot of these. It ended up being clinical and radiologic in a lot of the non-UIP cases. Anybody know what that is? That was a new term for me. It's hairspray related. And this study's from the UK. I don't know if the women in the UK are using hairspray more than we do here. <laughs> this is a new paper. Um, but so there's a whole range of diseases here, and um, a lot of them require not just the pathologist but a multidisciplinary discussion to get to them. So this is one reason to support the earlier enthusiasm for a tissue biopsy that you sometimes end up with something that you weren't expecting. Um, so I think the conclusions from that study and some of the other conversation this morning is that multidisciplinary discussion is superior to histopathology alone and currently is the final word for diagnosis. And um, the corollary to that that I want to add here is that if you get a tissue diagnosis and you move ahead and over time the course in natural history were not what you were expecting given the tissue diagnosis, please pick up the phone, call your pathologist and ask for a retrospective review. We are not sensitive about that. We know that these diagnoses are not set in stone and can evolve over time. And contrary to the um, stereotype of the pathologist in the dark basement pushing diagnoses out from under the door, um, we definitely want to talk to you and we want to talk to the radiologist and make sure that we have the right, the right diagnosis. Um, just as we've been discussing, problematic for the pathologist are hypersensitivity and the reasons have been discussed. Non-necrotizing granulomas, sarcoid, hypersensitivity, and I've seen a few cases of UIP where there were a few scattered um, non-necrotizing granulomas, but the cases were otherwise typical. Um, and the problem of organizing pneumonia, which is usually a more acute injury, um, but if you cut it just wrong, it may look like a fibroblastic focus, and trainees sometimes struggle with trying to sort out the difference. Um, and as we've talked about, abundant published data affirm the benefits of the multidisciplinary approach, and you said there was no gold standard. Um, but um, there's this one great study not too long ago that looked at seven of these on an international basis. Um, Seventy patients were evaluated and assigned diagnoses in all these places, and agreement was really good for IPF and connective tissue disease related to ILD, and it sort of fell off after that, idiopathic NSIP and hypersensitivity less agreement, and there's no gold standard to say which country had the best multidisciplinary team. But, okay, um, and one other point I'd like to make is that when there's a discordance between a general and a pulmonary specialist pathologist in the diagnosis of interstitial lung disease, it's probably worth a request that you send it out to an expert. It's an easy thing to do, not very expensive. Um, and this was done at Walter Reed AFIP. It was before the AFIP closed. But they looked at 44 biopsies and they gave them to the pulmonary part of the AFIP and then they gave them to everybody else who didn't do lung pathology. And over half the time the diagnosis was different. And assuming that the pulmonary pathologists were correct in virtually all of those, there was a change in management triggered about two-thirds of the time. So it's probably worth the investment of a couple hundred dollars to send the biopsy out if you have any concerns. Um, that said, as we've moved into longer post-GIP, LIP, boot, GIP, Community pathologists are more and more familiar with the classification system and are becoming conversant. Um, and again, as the radiologists are, are picking off the ones and not requiring a tissue biopsy, um, it, that situation is changing. Um, avoiding the non-diagnostic bats, we've talked about this a little bit, um, but the main thing is to talk about, uh, talk to your biopsying surgeon and have a discussion about where the best target is. And then I've got some pictures at the end about the technical aspects of the biopsy that will also help you avoid a probable possible tissue diagnosis. So um, the periphery has been a big topic today. Um, this is an autopsy photograph of a normal lung. And the point I want to make here is that the outer two centimeters of the lung tissue just under the pleura contains no airways. It's all pretty much alveolar tissue. 
And if your biopsy samples this area only, you will not get any, very many bronchioles. And so um, if you're looking to exclude bronchiolocentricity, um, the shape and manner of taking the biopsy makes a big difference in the level of diagnostic um, accuracy. And I have not done this study, but maybe I need to. Um, and this is the microscopic view of the periphery of the lung, the pleura is here, and all alveolar tissue, we have an alveolar duct coming up right here, but really no bronchioles to speak of. And so what I tell the surgeons is do a pie wedge, not a canoe, all right? And what I mean by that is the red there is your canoe. If you take your biopsy like a little super, you know, superficial scoop, you're not gonna get deep enough to sample uh, airways of any kind, and so what you really want is the pie wedge, then here you're coming into the conducting airways a bit. Um, it's really a bigger problem in babies where there's a lot of resistance to going deep and taking much tissue, but even in adults, I think it can make the difference in adequacy. Um, just a word about non-surgical lung biopsy. We talked about the things we look for on transbronchial biopsy. I'm still seeing this routinely at Vanderbilt. Um, but the published sensitivity to establish a diagnosis of IPF is as low as 10%, and I've seen one paper as high as 30%. But essentially, you know, what I conclude is that this is really not a sufficient uh, modality for accurate diagnosis of UIP or NSIP. Just want to say a word about cryobiopsy, and there are others that know a lot more about this than I do, but um, this is a particularly outstanding one that looks almost like a minor wedge, almost two centimeters in length. Um, mostly they're not that large. 0.8 to 1.2 centimeters is the maximal dimension. Um, we're doing some work on this at Vanderbilt. It looks like it's going to be possible to perhaps diagnose UIP and NSIP with some frequency, but it's not perfect. Don't know what the optimal number of biopsies is going to be, and there are some complications. Um, and um, hopefully somewhere down the road, just as we talked about for radiology, that there will be some published criteria from the ATS or other groups about how many cryobiopsies and what features uh, are going to be needed to make accurate and confident diagnosis. But the predictive value of cryobiopsy at the moment for the diagnosis of ILD is not established. The other point I want to make is that about a year and a half ago, I went to a Maryland Society of Pathologists meeting and I asked how many pathologists were actually seeing cryobiopsy and only one person raised their hand and they were in practice at, um, at the Johns Hopkins. So there weren't many community pathologists who were seeing these and it, that's changing now more all the time. But, you know, we struggle enough with VATS biopsies for interstitial lung disease, and I think the cryobiopsy thing is going to add another layer of difficulty. I think we'll get there, but we're not there quite yet. And I want to finish with um, a beautiful picture of normal lung tissue with a normal airway and intact alveoli, just to remind us all before we go to lunch of what we were, we're trying to go. <laughs> that's it.